Thank you very much. My name is Julie Mayer. I'm an engineer with the FDA's Shellfish and Aquaculture Policy Branch in our Office of Food Safety. And today I'm going to be talking about using hydrographic dye studies to assess pollution impacts on shellfish growing areas. And when I talk about shellfish, I'm specifically talking about bivalve molluscan shellfish, such as oysters, clams, mussels. These are filter feeders, so they're particularly dirty. <laughs> and many of you probably know that people often get sick from eating raw oysters. And that's, that's the biggest problem we face, raw oysters. So what we do is these uh, hydrographic dye studies to assess pollution sources near oyster growing areas and other shellfish growing areas. We actually will inject this bright red fluorescent rhodamine dye into the pollution source and then we'll track where it goes with a boat. And I'm going to talk more about this tonight. But what we have is wastewater treatment plants, broken sewer lines, and other pollution sources like that that can impact our shellfish growing areas. And what we try to do is create buffer zones around those sites, prohibited areas, so that we ensure they don't have an impact on the shellfish that you eat. Okay. Oops. <laughs> ah. Okay. So how do we determine the size of these buffer zones? How do we determine how much dilution is needed? Now what you, when you have a sewage source, what you want to do is dilute it with water, as much water as you possibly can. We always say dilution is the solution to pollution. Uh -huh. Have you heard that before? Yeah. And it's true. So what we need to do is modeling first. And we use some very complex computer models that can simulate different tides and current conditions, different wind conditions, uh, bathymetry of the area. And then we can estimate what's going to happen to that pollution as it travels through the water. But unfortunately, computer modeling can only take us so far. There's some things computer models don't account for, like eddies, for example, or the depth of the water and die, uh, or I should say sewage can get trapped at depth. So we really need to do real life studies in order to determine what actually happens to that pollution. And we do something called drogue studies, which I'm going to talk to you about a little bit more later. And we do dye studies, which I mentioned. And then what we do is we take the results of those drogue studies and dye studies and we create our own models. We create our own computer models based on the real life results. So each time the models get better and better and better. And then we share those models with our state partners, our industry partners, and our international partners. So hydrographic dye studies. There's, uh, we call point sources things such as wastewater treatment plants. And non-point sources are things such as leaking pipes, broken septic tanks, things that pose a particular problem when it rains. Today I'm actually going to focus on wastewater treatment plants because a lot of the dye studies we do are in wastewater treatment plant effluent or the treated sewage. Now people will sometimes ask, well, if it's treated sewage, then why worry about it? Why would it have any bad impact on your oysters? The problem is even treated sewage can have viruses in it, such as neurovirus and hepatitis A. Even the best treated sewage, it doesn't necessarily ensure that viruses won't get through because viruses have very, very high survivability. They can survive a lot. So the treatment at the treatment plant might kill your bacteria, but may not necessarily kill those viruses. So what we do is we review the management plan for the wastewater treatment plants, the type of treatment type, uh, the treatment type they use, chlorine for example versus UV versus membrane or ozone. And then we evaluate all possible types of malfunctions or failures that can occur. And then we look at the treatment plant's emergency response time. 
Some of them have 24-hour coverage. Most treatment plants in the country, people go home on the weekends. <laughs> and what always happens is the failure occurs on the weekend when people are at home. <laughs> so that can pose a problem. Now, when we do a dye study, we're actually evaluating it two different ways. The first way is a non-steady state dye study. That's where we're just looking at a short-term failure condition, like less than six hours. So let's say the treatment plant can detect that failure and shut down uh, in less than six hours. We can shut down the growing area. That's one type of failure. In that case, we conduct a single tide release of dye and we determine the dilution necessary to uh, get down to 14 fecal coliforms per 100 mils. Why 14? because that's the standard that we use in the National Shellfish Sanitation Program. Along the uh, many, many years the program's been in existence, and it's been around since 1925, but back then it was created because of typhoid problems. Now most of our problems are related to viruses and Vibrio. But we established this 14 standard, so if you can get it diluted down from the millions of fecal coliforms you start out with at the treatment plant down to 14, we say that's sufficient to have an approved growing area. Approved growing area means you can take those oysters or clams or mussels and send them directly to market. Now a steady state dye study is a little bit different. In that case we actually inject the dye over several tidal cycles to measure the buildup and determine steady state concentrations. Steady state means that the amount of sewage coming into your estuary, your system, is the same as that being flushed out by the tides. So you're looking at that steady state rate. And FDA recommends a thousand to one steady state dilution zone. That's just a recommendation as industry will often point out. <laughs> it's not part of our federal codes or the NSSP regulations just yet. And I'll try to avoid using too many acronyms. I know people. <laughs> yeah. The steady state is your day to day condition? Yes, that's, that's absolutely right. I, I'm glad you pointed that out. Steady state are your day to day conditions. So that's your normal operating conditions. And that's what we worry about in, in regards to viruses, because even when the treatment plant's operating normally, you can still have virus problems. But the non-steady state, the short-term failure, we're looking at fecal coliforms, we're looking at bacterial problems, because that means your, your treatment plant just failed and you have all sorts of raw sewage just coming towards your shellfish. So that's why we do short-term uh, failure evaluations as well. All right, so I'm gonna show you some pictures and talk about a study we did in Yarmouth, Maine back in 2010. Coincidentally, this weekend, I'm actually flying back to Yarmouth, Maine to do a follow-up study there. And I love Yarmouth, Maine because they have lots of lobster. Really cheap, good lobster. And this is a picture from one of the lobster stands in Yarmouth. <laughs> now this was in 2010, it was a cooperative project between FDA and the Maine Department of Marine Resources, Environment Canada, EPA and industry. We often have a lot of different partners when we do these studies because they're very expensive, very complex, very time consuming studies. And on this study uh, I'm going to do next week, we also have EPA and DMR and industry involved. So we did drogue studies to determine travel time. And again, I'll talk about that in the next slide. We did a half tidal day dye injection, approximately 12.4 hours. And we used a method called superposition to determine buildup. I'm gonna talk more about that later as well. In the past though, we had to do these three or four day dye injections, can you imagine? And there was this one guy named Virgil Carr who would stay awake for three straight days monitoring the dye injection. <laughs> he would sleep next to the dye, he would, he would never go to, or, he would never leave the site of the dye injection for three days. And you can imagine how red the water got when you're injecting dye for three days straight. But what we've learned is with this new method of superposition, you don't really need to do that. You can determine steady state by just doing a 12 hour injection. And we, but we do conduct plume tracking for three days. 
So that's when you're out on the boat and you're tracking where the dye goes. And the reason we're using dye is because that represents the sewage. It's dye tagged sewage. So we can measure the concentration of dye and that tells us what the concentration of sewage is. The dye fluoresces, so we have fluorometers that can measure the exact level of fluorescence and translate that into dye concentration. Whereas it's much harder for us to measure concentration of the sewage alone. And we actually deployed five oyster stations uh, with submersible fluorometers. So each one of these oyster stations had a fluorometer attached to it, and I have a picture of that. And that was uh, monitoring the levels of dye that were passing over the oysters. And then those oysters were tested by our microbiologists. So we knew exactly how much contamination they had received. Uh, many CTDs, a CTD measures conductivity, temperature, and depth were also attached. All right, so here's the Yarmouth study area. The diffuser is the outfall of the wastewater treatment plant. That's where all the sewage is coming out. And here's where our five stations were deployed. So we had oysters at each one of these stations and we had fluorometers that could measure the concentration of dye at each station. We also track the dye with boats, like I mentioned. So we're, we're looking at it two ways. We're looking at it at the stations and we're looking at it with the boat. Now a drogue study we do before we do the dye study. This is a drogue. Now a drogue can help us determine the time of travel to conditionally approved harvest areas. And we can measure that against the wastewater treatment plant response time. So it helps us with the timing of the study, it helps us determine the velocity at which the tides and currents are moving. Now this drogue actually has a GPS unit attached to it so we can track it down. Many times we lose our drogues. And so I bought a whole bunch of really cheap GPS's to attach to them <laughs> so we can try and track them down. Now this is an Environment Canada guy. He, uh, he puts his address on the drogue with the GPS and he says if you find this please return to Environment Canada at this address. And people in Canada actually do that. <laughs> People here in America, not so much. So, <laughs> he's like, you find a GPS. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so we're not quite that lucky, but we can track them using these GPSs. And what else do you think we might be able to use as drogues other than something that's designed like this? What do you think is something really cheap and easy that we could buy at our local supermarket that might serve as a drogue? A paper plate. <laughs> Plastic bottles. Plastic bottles. Yeah, I mean, we could, we could use like a, a big laundry detergent bottle, anything that floats really, but what we like to use are oranges and grapefruits. We call those fruit drogues because they're bright, they're easy to see. You can buy 50 of them, 100, you just throw them in the water and you mark the time and then you can track where they go. You can even write numbers on them so you know you can drop numbers 1 through 10 at 5 p.m. and then you drop numbers 11 through 20 at 6 p.m. and you can see how fast the tides are moving because the tides over a tidal cycle at the beginning the tides are moving slow but they they build up faster and faster as the cycle moves on and you want to see how fast they're moving because that helps you design your dye study. So there's the drogue floating down the river. <laughs> yeah. Is the float rate on the surface usually the same as the deeper float rates? Uh, that's a very good question. I don't know if you all heard that, but he said, is the flow rate on the surface the same as the deeper flow rates? The, for example, if you were, had a drogue suspended at one foot down or two feet down, is it traveling at the same rate as the surface? The, a the answer to that is usually no. So the, what we find is if you deploy a drogue like this and you saw the aluminum on the bottom, that's actually suspended about a foot down, maybe two feet down. 
that tends to move slower than the ones, the fruit droves, your oranges and grapefruits that are just on the surface because the wind also plays a factor. The wind can be pushing those as well. Some cases the wind is so strong that it will push your uh, oranges in the opposite direction that the tides are moving. <laughs> and you say, what on earth is going on? Why are they going that way instead of that way? <laughs> so actually we find these types of droves work better because you do want to get it suspended lower uh, in the water column. That's a very good question. All right, so here's an example of the dye injection. See how bright pink it looks? We usually like to issue media releases before we do this <laughs> because as you can imagine when you're turning the water bright bright red it causes mass panic and it looks like blood on the water, it really does. <laughs> so we try and issue as many newspaper releases, get it in the local news, let everybody know that we're going to do a dye injection like this or we try to do it at night time when everyone's asleep. <laughs> so this was in Mobile Bay, Alabama. Uh, it was approximately a one to three million gallon per day wastewater treatment plant. Uh, we were, or, um, actually that's in Yarmouth, I should say, was the one to three million gallon. So that's a pretty small treatment plant. The one in Mobile Bay actually was a 30 million gallon per day treatment plant. Uh, there's one up in Montreal, Canada that's one billion <laughs> gallons a day if you can imagine that. So you have all different sized treatment plants. And then we used this bright red rhodamine tracer dye. We injected for half a tidal day and then we used the superposition method which I'll talk about later. So there's the dye on the water. This was a relatively small injection we did in Yarmouth so that doesn't look too bad. Uh, if you see some of the larger ones we've done with 30 gallons of dye, <laughs> I mean it turns the whole river red. Now this is really interesting. This is a leak we saw along the side of uh, where the treatment outfall was. Now we, we injected the dye and we saw it coming out the outfall and going in the direction we expected it to go. However, on the, on the other shoreline we saw this little uh, leak of dye that was going the opposite direction and we didn't know where it was coming from. So what do you think might have been happening? What do you think we, we theorized was occurring when we saw, saw this? Well, we said there's probably a leak in the outfall pipe, right? There's probably a broken part of that pipe and that's what's leaking out here and then the rest of it the vast majority of dye was coming through the outfall but you did see this little leakage so immediately EPA called the wastewater treatment plant and said oh you got a problem <laughs> I think you got a broken outfall pipe which they weren't very happy to hear but <laughs> that goes to show you one of the many uses of these dye tracer techniques. How would you know that you had a broken pipe unless you see uh, something like this, right? You don't see the sewage, treated sewage coming out of the pipe because it looks like water at that point. And there's the there's the leak along the shoreline with the little bird. <laughs> All right, so here's our boat tracking fluorometer. And we had this wing specially designed by a machinist. This is the fluorometer right here. It's really tiny. In the past, our fluorometers were this big and they had all sorts of tubes coming in and out of them. You had a tube bringing in the water and then it would be read by the fluorometer sensor and then another tube shooting the water out the other side. Nowadays, we have these tiny little fluorometers and we can attach it to this little wing stick a buoy ball on the end of it and tow it behind the boat uh, with this black data cable you see here. It's a very easy process compared to what we had to do in the past. So that's what it looks like when the, uh, we're using the boat tracking fluorometer. I'm actually going to show you a really neat video as well that shows what this looks like in real time. And that's me monitoring the GPS and boat tracking. That's a Trimble device. So this is really just a handheld GPS computer that attaches to the fluorometer. 
So I'm getting the readings from the fluorometer and at the same time I'm getting GPS readings on the computer. So it's linking the GPS data, global positioning system data, your latitude and longitude, with the fluorometer readings. And then we can map that in a global uh, geographic information system. And I'll show you what the maps look like. It's really neat. So this is what the submersible fluorometers attached to the cages look like. And there's our oyster cage on the bottom there. Uh, these continuously record the concentration of dye, which is great. So even when we're sleeping in our hotel rooms at night, they're still recording data for us. The only problem is we don't know if they're actually working or not. because <laughs> Sometimes they're deployed 10 feet down, 20 feet down, 30 feet down. We would like to design a system that would actually uh, take the data signal from here and transport it up to the surface to a, a beacon attached to a buoy at the surface that will send us a Wi-Fi signal and let us know that it's recording data and what data it's recording. But as it is now, we have to haul up these really heavy cages periodically and check on them and just make sure they're still, they're still powered on, they're still working. And we also deployed the uh, Star AUDI mini CTDs. I've got a picture of those as well. They're, they're about this big. And they measure conductivity, time, and depth. In the past, they were about the same size as me. They were like that, <laughs> that big. <laughs> Nowadays, they're the size of a bullet or an enema. <laughs> they're really tiny. So this is how we calculate dilution. Are you, are you guys familiar with conservation of mass? Okay. So basically, you have your concentration in your jug of dye, and you can multiply that by the flow coming out of the jug of dye. That will be equivalent to the concentration and the outfall of the wastewater treatment plant multiplied by the flow of the outfall, which is also equivalent to the concentration we measure in the estuary or the river multiplied by the flow of the river. So in order to determine dilution, we just uh, divide C out by the uh, concentration in the estuary. Now this is the superposition equation. I'm, I'm going to try not to bore you with too much math. Or, well, if you want to be bored with math, let me know. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> These are, uh, this is how superposition works. So like I said, in the past we had to do these dye injections for days and days on end. But now we can do a half tidal day, uh, half tidal day injection. And what happens is, this is the dye we measure on day one. This is the dye we measure on day two. We add the dye we measured on day two to the dye we measure on day one. And then we add the dye we measure on day three, which is much less, of course, to the dye we measured on days one and two. So uh, over time, this is the buildup of the dye. But what we're actually measuring in the estuary, it gets less and less with each passing day because it's being flushed out by the tides. We stop doing the dye injection on this day. Now in the past, we would just do the dye injection for all three days, so you'd get the same exact curve, but it, you know, you'd see the buildup over three days. But then we realized, you don't need to keep doing the dye injection for three days to get this curve. You can do it for half a day, and you can just take the measurements and add them to the original day's measurement. Does that make sense? Yeah. It, and it saves us a huge amount of time and money because this dye is very expensive. And like I said, we don't really want to sleep by the dye injection for three days. <laughs> so this, this superposition method has been really beneficial to us. In using the dye, does it dissolve? What's that? In using the dye in your studies, does it dissolve? Oh. What, what actually happens? Does it cause any problems? Oh, no, no. That's a very good question. Yes, does the dye dissolve or does it cause any problems? No, this is, dye is very environmentally safe. It's been used by decades. EPA uses it and they've done many, many studies with it. So it doesn't cause any problems with the environment. And uh, FDA's used it for many decades as well. And so it's, it's perfectly safe as far as all the studies that have been done are concerned. Does it dissolve? Uh, 
No, it actually doesn't dissolve or degrade very much. Uh, you can have a little bit of degradation uh, from the sun, for example, but it actually uh, holds up pretty well in the environment, but what happens is it gets diluted. I mean, you have these massive river systems, ocean systems, and the dye particles just get diluted over this uh, huge volume. So by the second day, you can't even see them anymore. You can't even see the dye. You can only see it on the first day. Uh, but our instruments, our fluorometers are incredibly sensitive. They can detect the dye down to 0.1 parts per billion in, in an ocean system. In the laboratory, in distilled water, they can actually detect it down to 0.01 parts per billion. That's how sensitive our instruments are. So even though you can't see the dye anymore, and even though it's, it's very, very dispersed and diluted, we can still pick it up with our fluorometers. Um, so it's not dissolving, it's just dissipating. Yeah, it's getting diluted just like the sewage does. Now, this is an example of what the data from our submersible fluorometers looks like. So again, we employed the superposition method. There's three different ways you can do it. You can look at a half tidal day maximum. So these are just taking the maximum values on each tidal day. And that's what you see up here. That's an extremely conservative way to do it because you're taking the absolute highest value on each day and looking at that. Or you can take the peak one hour, so that's the maximum for each hour. Or you can take the half tidal day average, which you see down there. And the average would be like right about here, right in the middle of each one of these curves. So that's much lower than the other two. What we tend to use, we tend to use the middle one, the peak one hour, because that's conservative, but it's still a lot more realistic than using the maximum values. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is what our GIS uh, map looks like. And you can see all the different colors. So the blue, the dark blue, represents zero dye. That's what you see over here. That means we're not detecting any more dye once it gets out to this point. And this is where we were injecting the dye. Some of it actually went backwards, because on the flood tide, the tide's coming in, it can push the dye backwards this way while it's flooding. But then the tides turn and it moves out the other way. So we have the green concentrations, the yellow and red, you can barely see it there, but that's closest to where the outfall is. That's where it's really dark. You get very high dye concentrations there. But as it moves farther and farther out, it gets more and more diluted. Up until this point, the mouth, it's still pretty high dye concentrations, actually up to here. This is the mouth. But once it gets out to the mouth of this uh, little river here, it spreads out and you see how diluted it gets. But some of the dye actually moves up here into this other river, the Cousins River. And one of the questions we had before we did this study was, does the sewage from this treatment plant come up into the Cousins River? Because we were seeing problems, we were seeing high uh, readings, micro readings up in the Cousins River. And we weren't sure if this sewage could re would go up here or not. So by doing a study like this, you see, yes, it definitely does go up into the Cousins. Mm -hmm. Technically, it's an estuary or tidal river? Uh, well, we use both terms. This is called the Royal River. That's the Cousins River. But we refer to the whole system as the estuary. Well, then there's tidal and non-tidal areas. Right. Yeah, this is a tidal area. It's tidally influenced. Um, here's another map that we created. This is day two. You can see on day two, you get a lot less uh, green and yellow and orange. At that point, most of the dye is dissipated. By day three, you're really not seeing much dye at all. Very, very low concentrate, less than 0 0.5 parts per billion. By the way, a part per billion, think about uh, if you had a tiny particle of soda in gallons and gallons and gallons of water, <laughs> you know, you had one billion particles of water and one particle of soda, that's one part per billion.
So this is uh, another GIS map, and this shows a study we did in Mobile Bay. Um, so the red areas, this is where we injected the dye, and this is how it spread out. And even down to this level, we were still getting uh, pretty high dye concentrations. That's four miles away from the treatment plant. So think about that. You know, in some cases, it can be miles and miles away, and we're still getting sewage levels of concern. So this is our new technology. This is called mobile GIS. This allows us to do uh, the GIS in real time. Before it used to take us many hours to do that. Now we're doing it instantly out in the field. We can show our state partners what we find automatically. It's been great. And that's me in Coos Bay, Oregon with a rainbow shooting out my finger. <laughs> uh, I really enjoyed that study. Uh, Coos Bay is, is such a beautiful place and we got a lot of really good data from that study as we did in Yarmouth, Maine as well. Uh, I, I have to say I really enjoy doing this work. <laughs> so if you have any questions I'd be happy to answer those and I also have a couple videos I'd like to show you as well from a recent study I just did in Korea. I just got back two weeks ago so these are almost brand new videos. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a certain amount of effluent that's actually allowed. <laughs> like with most things, there's always going to be some level of pollution or contamination, but we have different action levels uh, or tolerance levels. So like I said, even if you, have, if you have 14 fecal coliform levels or less, that's okay. But let's say it's, we're finding high levels of pollution in the area. Uh, what we do, we work with the state to reclassify those growing areas. We give them recommendations. We say, you need to uh, expand your prohibited zone around this wastewater treatment plant or around this uh, collection system because you have a problem here. It, it's getting to the shellfish and your prohibited zone isn't large enough. So that's what we do. We recommend that they, they reclassify the growing area. So you add more water uh, between the pollution source and the shellfish. Uh, so before they can harvest the shellfish, that pollution will get diluted. Uh, the states don't always listen to our recommendations. <laughs> and what people don't realize is that the shellfish program, now this isn't true of all seafood. The shellfish program is unique within FDA. Uh, it's, there's also a grade A milk program that's similar. It's a cooperative program with the states. So FDA doesn't just tell the states what to do. It's not just written in FDA regulations. It's a, a national shellfish sanitation program. And we have to work cooperatively with the states. And the states uh, can take our recommendations or they can uh, follow their own path. They usually will take our recommendations and they'll, they'll listen to FDA because they, they're the ones that ask for our technical assistance in doing these studies. They want our, uh, they want our assistance and our recommendations because they want to make sure that their shellfish coming out of that state is safe. Mm. Yeah. But if you're responding to a particular issue like the Norwalk virus or, or mm -hmm. something else, do, do you then expand or do you then sample for that instead of treat the cold form? We actually have been doing a lot of Norwalk virus or norovirus testing. Uh, for example, with the shellfish we deployed in the cages, we'll test them for fecal coliforms, something called male-specific coliphage, which is an indicator for norovirus, E. coli, and the norovirus. And we like to compare all of these different uh, microbiological criteria. What we're really concerned about is the viruses. The other things, the fecals and the male-specific coliphage, the E. coli, those are all indicators for the viruses. Those tell us there might be viruses there because they're indicators of a sewage problem. 
The issue we're finding, though, is that the fecal coliforms and the E. coli are not very good indicators for norovirus. Because <laughs> a lot of times you'll find norovirus, but they're there won't be any fecals there, or there won't be E. coli, or vice versa. You might have very high fecals and E. coli, but no norovirus. So that's uh, something our microbiologists are actually grappling with right now. They're trying to address that issue. And that's why male-specific colophage has come up, because we find it's a better indicator than the others. Uh, Julie, uh, just two quick ones. Mm -hmm. From your studies, are there inherent dangers in the food supply that are getting worse, like by more of the sewage and the viruses getting into the shellfish and the, you know, the seafood in general. And then the second question is, I may say, with hydraulic fracturing going deep into the earth and mm -hmm. injecting hundreds of millions of gallons of water in the process, and then the deep drilling for injection of water that's toxic, could your approach with the dyes be used to track the deep injection of water in hydraulic fracturing, known as fracking, uh, so it, it could be determined if it is penetrating the local water supplies? In other words, by an analogy to what you do very well, Right, right. And let me. Check. Yeah, those uh, actually those are very good questions. So the first question is, is the problem getting worse? Basically, uh, in my opinion, no. But that's just my opinion. I'm not speaking on behalf of FDA. But we always say that our program in the United States is the gold standard. And the U.S. has very, very strict shellfish regulations. And even though it's a cooperative program with the states, it's worked very effectively over many, many decades. Like I said, we've been doing this since 1925, right? <laughs> and we haven't had many, uh, I shouldn't say, well, we haven't had nearly as many outbreaks and other issues as some other countries have in regards to shellfish. So we've been very fortunate in that way. Our system seems to be working pretty well. And to have an approved area in the U.S., we have very, very stringent standards, really, really large prohibited zones around uh, wastewater treatment plants and other pollution sources. So I think the U.S. system's working pretty well. There are some states, and I will never mention any names, but <laughs> there are some states that have some problems, <laughs> but we're working with those states to address those issues. Now your second question about fracking and, and tracking of fracking fluids, for example, I can't speak to that specifically, but we have looked at tracking oil and the case of the BP oil spill, for example, we found that our fluorometers, uh, the ones we currently use can only detect rhodamine dye, but the same company, the, uh, Wet Labs Inc., they manufacture other fluorometers that they call triplets. Not only do they measure rhodamine dye, they can also measure uh, CDOM, which is an indicator for oil. And they, they were selling, they told me they were selling a lot of those fluorometers during the oil spill because people wanted to use them in the same way for tracking where the oil went, how big the oil plume was, how it was dispersed, how far down it was. Now this was at tremendous depth. And they have data cables that go way, 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 way down. Our data cables are only 50 meters long, so they don't go that deep. But you can get some very sophisticated fluorometer technology that can go very deep. And, and I don't know if it would get to the depth of a, a fracking, because that's really far, that's miles down. But, you know, if the fluid was coming towards the surface, then you might be able to track it. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, sorry, <laughs> there's three of you. All right, uh, one, two, three. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the uh, specific, many specific studies you've done mm -hmm. uh, for learning, uh, can they be generalized to make predictions uh, in other areas where hydrodynamic data are known, such as transferring this information to, to Chesapeake Bay areas, for example? Um, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't see why not. Um, actually, we're hoping to do some work with the state of Maryland. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have our own uh, boats and we don't have our own research facility on the water. 
FDA used to have that in Rhode Island, but then they moved everybody down to Washington, D.C., and they put our microbiologist in Alabama, a, a place <laughs> called Dolphin Island. So, uh, But so we've been talking to the state of Maryland about doing some work in the Chesapeake with them. And um, they, they would very much like to do some dye studies. The state does dye studies themselves, but most states like Maryland just do a big batch release of dye. And I'm gonna show you in one of our videos sort of what that looks like. It's just you take a bottle of dye and you go like this. We're injecting dye with a pump over 12 hours. We're doing it, we're feeding it at a certain number of milliliters per minute. And we're, we're doing a, a constant rate injection. So it's a very different process than just doing a slug of dye. But that's, that's typically what the states would do. Um, when, you, uh, when you determine your prohibitive areas, mm -hmm. um, I noticed like in Mobile Bay that you had several high concentrations, you know, just sort of beating down. Right, right, right. And you've got clear water and then you've got high concentrations. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me go back to that slide if I'm able to. Oh, here it is. Okay, so remember I talked earlier about the thousand to one dilution? I, mean, I could easily talk about each of these slides for five minutes, but I don't want to bore you guys and I didn't have enough time. But uh, if you look at the lines on here, this is where, so I talked about the three different ways you can look at uh, dilution over steady state. So you can look at the peak one hours, you can look at the maximum, or you can look at the average. And so that's what the lines you see here are. This is the average one. Uh, this is the peak and this is the maximum. So we would tell the state, well, use one of these lines and anything um, above the line so we'd probably use this one here. But anything above this line needs to be prohibited because obviously the sewage is able to reach all the way down here at levels that are of concern to us. Anything below the line, there's many different ways we can classify the area. And we look at a lot of different factors. Uh, it would take me an hour to go into all the different growing area classifications, but um, at, it's, at least I could say for sure, you know, anything above this line we'd want to be prohibited. And then below that, we look at a lot of different conditions. We look at our models. We say, okay, do we want this area to be approved? Do we want it to be conditionally approved? Do we want it to be restricted? And if you'd like to know more about those different classifications, I can talk to you about that um, after the presentation. Yeah, yeah, it would actually be, as opposed to being a straight line, you're right, it would be like more of a radius like that. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. I'd say, yeah? Yeah, setting these levels, it seems to be the same for all kinds of shellfish. Some of them would normally be cooked and some would not, and some would be raw. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any difference at all. That's a very good question. Uh, he said, you know, in some cases the shellfish are eaten raw, sometimes they're eaten cooked. Usually when you cook the shellfish, you don't have the virus problems anymore. Uh, in some cases you can still have virus issues, especially if they're steamed or lightly cooked. Uh, but if you have fully cooked oysters, you're probably not going to get sick from viruses. However, we don't know if the people are going to be eating them raw or cooked or what have you. So this would apply to any oysters. That way, uh, regardless of whether you eat them raw or not, they're going to be safe. Because even if you do cook them, you probably don't want to be eating oysters that are filled with sewage. <laughs> you might be safe from viruses, but nevertheless, <laughs> there's a certain filth factor there too. So we, I mean, we try to be as protective as possible. And Yeah, clams, clams are uh, much more seldom eaten raw, but uh, nevertheless, we still apply these same principles to uh, clams and mussels. And there are some populations that do eat raw clams, and uh, the the idea is to try and minimize the amount of sewage that gets into the uh, shellfish. And you know, a lot of 
A lot of people don't think about this, but by doing that, we're also uh, minimizing the amount of sewage that gets into your rivers and estuaries in general. Because what we try to do, in addition to setting these buffer zones, these prohibited areas, we try and get the states to mitigate the pollution sources. If you're, they're able to stop the pollution source, fix it, we tell them to do that. They, we say, you got this broken pipe over here the, at your outfall, you got this uh, broken sewage line pipe, and then the state will go and fix that. So we're, what we're trying to do is, whenever possible, prevent the sewage and pollution from even get it, reaching the growing areas in the first place. And that way, we're not only protecting shellfish, we're trying to keep the waters clean as well. Hmm? Uh, do you have any problems with uh, enforcing your prohibited zone? <laughs> With enforcing the prohibited zone, some of the states do have problems. There often is illegal harvesting in certain areas, but they have patrols that go around and they're constantly monitoring that and trying to, trying to ensure people don't illegally harvest. There's also recreational harvesting, which is allowed in some places. FDA is concerned with commercial harvesting. But if people, if the state allows recreational harvest and people want to har and they tell people you can harvest in areas that are <laughs> less than clean by NSSP standards well that's what the state might allow but people need to be aware of that they should be aware that um, of the classification of the area that they're harvesting in even if it's recreational are the areas posted so you can read it uh, well, yeah, the states post online exactly what the growing area classifications are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. Yes. Does it attach to organic material? In other words, is it carried by particles as well as dissolved? And if it gets into an oyster, can it be flushed out of an oyster? Are you referring to sewage or to the dye? Rotomy, the oh, the rhodomy. Oh, yes, definitely. Does it, attach to it does. Organic? It does attach to suspended particles. That's another reason for dye loss sometimes. So, in addition to sunlight degradation, you, it can attach to uh, solids and um, sink to the uh, the bottom. So that's another way that you might have uh, the dye dissipate as well. It can just suspend. It, it gets suspended on solids. Yeah. So that's yeah, that's a good but you know, it's 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 definitely not a danger to the the oysters and it, it, it will get flushed. You you won't see pink oysters unless they're like right at the outfall where the dye's coming out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that's a very controversial subject, and it's a very good question. <laughs> and I was, uh, I'd love to talk to you more about that. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, the truth is we'd love to be able to do dye studies on some of these chicken farms, but uh, you have to get permission in order to do that in some cases. Um, and it's not just a problem for oysters and shellfish in the Chesapeake. It can also be a problem for produce that's grown in that area as well. So, um, yeah, we'd like to be able to track all those pollution sources. And we have this new real-time mobile GIS tracking system. And we'd love to be able to use that for doing uh, just what you're describing, tracking pollution from chicken farms and all sorts of other pollution sites. Uh, it's a, this is a brand new system and we think that combined with our dye studies it could have uh, a lot of uses that extend even well beyond shellfish and the kind of studies I'm talking about here. Perhaps it could be used in the future for studies on uh, farms, produce farms for example, but um, that's something we're still investigating. Huh? Well, not at all, actually. 
<laughs> I studied biological environmental engineering, so it's definitely related to the work I'm doing now, but I didn't study oceanography or anything along those lines. Uh, I, my master's degree is actually in forensic science, and uh, Tina might have mentioned I'm going to be giving another talk in a few weeks on forensic science because I worked with the Arlington County Police Department and I worked with the uh, National Museum of Crime and Punishment as well and that's that was a true passion of mine forensics but uh, the the starting salary for a forensic scientist was 24,000 and the starting salary at FDA was 50,000 so <laughs> admittedly <laughs> but I, I really do love forensics and I love this job because the part, the reason I love forensic science is not the blood and the gore and the fingerprints and all of that, it's because of the detective work, the investigative work. And when I do this sort of work, I'm doing the same sort of thing. We have all these unknown pollution sources, we have norovirus, contamination of the shellfish. In many cases though we don't know where the problem's coming from and it's our job to figure that out. And by doing the dye studies, that's our investigative tool. That's how we can figure out where the problem's coming from, like that leak in the pipe I showed you earlier. And you also interview people and you also collect data from pollution sources. I'm often crawling through pipes and I'm collecting water samples and I'm doing testing of the water to see if the temperature is, is higher than normal because that's an indicator of sewage. So it's like I'm an investigator and it's a, it's a totally different kind of investigation than a crime scene investigation. But to me, that's, that's what gets my juices going, the investigative work. And it combines that with my engineering background. So that's why I really enjoy doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't do anything with heavy metals, do you? Uh, with heavy metal? That's a really good question. Chemical co contamination. And chemical contamination. Yeah, that's a really good question. My colleagues actually uh, do look at that, and that is part of the National Shellfish Sanitation Program. That's a big part, because you can have all sorts of contaminants. You can have uh, heavy metal contaminants. You can have industrial contaminants. So we look at everything, but most of the studies we do uh, with the dye, the dye work are focused on the virus issue. But some of my colleagues look at the heavy metal issue and, and other contaminants. Well, I get concerned about, say, buying baby clams that are, that are canned in Korea or Taiwan or something. I don't know what kind of environmental conditions those are canned under. I mean, right. they're, they're heated to kill the bacteria right. and the viruses, but the, you don't get rid of the heavy metal. Right. Right, but we do we do and we do send inspectors over to look at those, and we try to ensure that anybody who imports to the U.S. has the same safety standards that the U.S. has. And by establishing prohibited zones around treatment plants, we're also preventing things like pharmaceuticals and other uh, contaminants in the in the sewage or in the treatment plant effluent from getting to the oysters as well because they get diluted out too. So not only are you diluting the viruses, you're diluting all those other contaminants that are in the sewage. So that's another advantage. You might want to play your and that's true as, as well for, ev for products that are cooked. You also want to get rid of those contaminants regardless of whether it's cooked or not. You might want to play your videos before it starts getting... Oh, gosh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, if you have any more questions, please talk to me after the videos. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you. This is a video from Korea. This is called Julie Vomits Die. <laughs> one, problem, one problem we have is people vomiting off the side of boats. That's a big problem, believe it or not. Or people pooping off the side of boats. <laughs> <laughs> and this can cause a big uh, contamination issue. So we wanted to, we wanted to monitor, uh, model that with our dye, do a simulation of what it would be like if you uh, vomited <coughs> off the side of a boat. This is the first time I've done a simulation like this. Salute! Soju! <laughs> Soju's Korean alcohol, if you don't know. <laughs> the growing area. That's my uh, colleague Kevin talking to me there. I 
probably shouldn't have worn white for this demonstration. <laughs> right to this edge. and make sure it gets close enough that it doesn't splash up. So you're going to kneel down. You've got to kneel down. There you go. And make sure. Now usually we're pumping it with tubing. Yeah, you know, and a, way lower, so you're gonna This is the first time I've ever done it off the side of a yeah, boat, like lower. just pouring it go. like this. That's good. Okay, now you can puke. <laughs> there you go. That's a good one. Now dip your bottle in and uh, grab the rest of it for a second dose of puking. <laughs> She'll be doing that soon too, you know. Every time she drinks soju. <laughs> it's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> My colleague's got a sick sense of humor. <laughs> Keep going. Couple more extra. Yeah. Well, look at look at the depth. Look at the depth that it's dropping now. That's pretty cool. You wouldn't think it would drop that deep. That's cool. Yep. Keep rinsing it. <laughs> she likes. She, she's an actress. She's an actress. <laughs> a little over the top. <laughs> Keep rinsing all though. Shake, shake the bottom. Shake it. There you go. So this is usually what happens when people are vomiting. They don't just vomit once. You got <laughs> success. <laughs> there you go. That's pretty good. Excellent job. Now I think that's you do. That way we get a nice hard slug. Okay. So that, see how the dye sticks together like that? Uh, so it, it often will travel as a nice slug of dye for quite a while before it starts to spread out and dissipate and dilute. So what I'm going to show you next is a video of us tracking the dye. And uh, after that, I'll be done. <laughs> Sorry that I'm over, a little bit over time. But.